All right, this is uh, Mr. Beckstrom here again, and I've got a quick screencast for you on um, the Japanese response to imperialism, um, which you can kind of sum up by saying, if you can't beat them, join them. Uh, I ask my students to take corner notes on this at home. Uh, make sure that you're using the left-hand column to point out main ideas in your own words and to ask questions from anything in the notes that you don't quite get. Also, make sure to do a summary on your Cornell notes. So here we go. Um, before Japan was imperialized, it was a uh, feudal state um, ruled by the Tokugawa shoguns. A shogun is a military leader, um, and they had little contact with the West, and that's pretty much the way that they liked it. Um, the feudal system, you've probably heard of uh, samurai, um, which are kind of the Japanese equivalent to a knight in, in uh, like Western language. Um, they were the warriors, and they were kind of right there in the middle of the feudal system, and um, they were the ones who kind of like owned little bits of land and things like that, and helped the, uh, the shoguns or the, the higher rulers of Japan kind of maintain uh, a sort of a military-style dictatorship with a heavy emphasis on like a code of honor, the Japanese called Bushido, the warrior code. Um, and there wasn't, there wasn't a whole lot of war going on. There was a kind of this like top-down feudal system control of the country um, was effective at keeping people in Japan from fighting with each other and Japan being isolated from the rest of the world, uh, you know, it was an island um, and, uh, and all that, made for uh, centuries of peace. So that's nice. Um, and then in uh, the 1860s, along comes the United States. So this guy is Commodore Perry. Commodore is not his name. It's actually a naval title. Um, uh, came to Japan, and they wanted to talk about trade. And this is an area of, era of imperialism where um, all the rest of Asia was being carved up by the Western imperialist countries. Um, and Japan was a place that all of these Western imperialist countries wanted to trade, um, in essence, kind of like give them stuff and, and take what they wanted from Japan in terms of trade goods and other things that the Japanese had that they might want. Um, and when Commodore Perry showed up, they showed up with a whole fleet of ships that were painted black. Um, this is a Japanese artist's rendition of those ships. Um, you can take a moment to think about this question and pause the video. What I would uh, always encourage you to do is to point out details. For example, you know, I see some eyes or some eye-looking things on the back of the ship here um, and what might appear to be a mouth in the opening of the back of the ship. And then you might interpret that detail later to say, oh, the... Sorry, excuse the bell there. Um, you know, you can see the look on this face is one that I interpret as being a look of fear uh, or a look of aggression. Uh, this is a giant open mouth that's going to come and eat us. And what you can see here is uh, another kind of aggressive looking face on the front of the boat. And uh, your answers to this may vary. The Japanese people obviously felt that the, uh, the Americans were not there to really help them, but to take things from them. Um, and so that's exactly what happened. Japan was forcibly open. This is, you know, the Americans, Americans showed up um, and said, hey, you know, if, if you don't let us in, we're shooting our way in. So you're going to trade with us or you're going to go to war with us kind of thing. Um, European, other European nations after the United States followed, and they were granted extraterritorial rights. Uh, what that means is that um, you didn't have to follow the laws of Japan when you're in Japan. Um, which is you know, another offense to the Japanese people. Um, you know, here's another opportunity for you to answer this question. I would like you to answer this question in your notes. You can pause the video now. So I talked to you a little bit earlier about you know, if you can't beat them, join them. And this is what we see happening with Japan. So in the decades following the quote-unquote opening of Japan, we see what's called the Meiji Restoration, um, where there's some change in the Japanese leadership, and they decide to focus, instead of staying isolated from the, the West and from new technologies and things that had made the Western armies capable of coming and forcing the, 
their will upon the Japanese. They decided to quickly modernize and industrialize their country and their economy to try to compete with those Western imperialist powers. Um, so they, you know, kind of emulated European designs in terms of you know, war making and weapons and industrialization factories, modernizing their their system of transportation, um, railroads, factories, shipbuilding, all of that. Um, sending students to study in the West and um, to try to convince Western powers of their equality, though there was a lot of racism at work here, and the Japanese are, of course, not white, uh, according to what all the imperialist nations thought. So uh, they were definitely not kind of welcomed with open arms into the imperialist club. Um, you can see here is an illustration of a Japanese factory. You can see this factory machine, the kind of uh, wheel spinning in the back, turning these belts, which were working on these machines. This looks uh, to be some sort of um, perhaps a textile factory or something like that. Um, so this is an illustration of uh, what we were talking about, of modernizing the Japanese economy. Um, and that idea that if you can't beat them, join them. Uh, Japan became an imperial power. They went to war with Korea. You can see the dates there, or with China over Korea, and they imperialized Korea in the end of the 1890s. Um, so it didn't take Japan long to turn itself into an imperialist power to realize that, hey, if we don't, you know, if we don't learn to fight fire with fire here, we're going to get taken over. Um, Japan gained its first colonies in uh, Taiwan and the Pescadores Islands. Here's a map of China. Um, you can see the Korean Peninsula is here. Taiwan is here. Japan is actually off the map to the right slightly. Uh, and in the, uh, the Russo-Japanese War in the early 1900s, Japan beat Russia, and the rest of the world was like very shocked. Oh my god, how could this tiny little Asian country be big, powerful Russia? Um, but they did, and this kind of announced Japan's power on the imperialist scene, their defeat of Russia, big boost uh, of morale, as it says there, and Japan was able to also occupy Korea, and um, Korea became a, the first like, kind of large imperial holding of the Japanese empire, which would um, later on eventually take up most of the Pacific. You can see here a map of the Japanese empire in 1942, so this takes us all the way forward to World War to, and most of this territory was gained by the Japanese um, <coughs> excuse me, after the start of World War II. You can see Korea here, and here are the Japanese home islands here. Um, and then this area of Manchuria, the Japanese imperialized in the uh, 1930s. And much of the rest of this was taken by Japan in the uh, late 1930s and early 1940s. 